In this presentation, we will take a look at the auditing process related to property, plant, and equipment, PP and E, also known or sometimes called fixed assets or depreciable assets. When considering the audit process for property, plant, and equipment, those depreciable assets, those things like land, things like equipment, things like buildings. First, a word from our sponsor. Well, actually, these are just items that we picked from the YouTube Shopping Affiliate Program, but that's actually good for you because these aren't things that were just given to us from some large corporation which we don't even use in exchange for us selling them to you. These are things that we actually researched, purchased, and used ourselves. Bayer Dynamic, not sure if I said that right, but this is the DT770 Pro 250 OHM Studio Reference Closed Back Headphones. I wear headphones basically every day for a large part of the day. They are important to me. Therefore, I've gone through many different kinds of headphones. I've had these for some time and they've worked quite well. They fit over my ears, but I'm still able to put my glasses on under the headphones. The headphones not pinching too tight on the glasses to give me a headache, which is nice. The quality of the padding is good and it has lasted for some time. I've had these for some time now and they haven't gotten all torn up on me or anything like that. I also like that I have a cord when I'm doing my recordings as opposed to a USB centered headphone because that frees up a USB port and I find the USB headphones to be less reliable. They come with an audio jack that looks like this, which is useful for me because that plugs into my audio interface. However, if you want to use the headphones for some other purpose, I believe it's fairly easy to get a converter to other types of audio jacks. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com where we have many different courses. You can purchase one at a time or have a subscription model giving you access to all the courses. Courses which are well organized have other resources like Excel files and PDF files to download and no commercials. These are going to be things that will typically be significant. They're going to be large amounts on the financial statements. So they're going to be something that's going to warrant our concern. Of course, as the auditor, they will, in other words, be material factors that we need to consider. Now, there are characteristics of property, plant, and equipment that can make them easier in some situations, such as an audit where it's an incur a recurring engagement. Normally, that's the case. So normally, we have an engagement, hopefully, that we've been auditing the same client for some time now, and therefore, it's a recurring engagement, and we can rely to some degree with regards to property, plant, and equipment on prior year types of transactions because these, of course, are long-lived type of assets from prior years. So auditor can focus on additions and retirements in the current year. Therefore, amounts from prior periods will have been subject to audit procedures in the prior years. In other words, property, plant, and equipment, things that last for many, many years, we're going to have a schedule of the property, plant, and equipment. The things that have been purchased in the past are things that were subject to some degree to audits in the past. And therefore, we don't have to really audit the purchasing process again, as we would in, say, new engagements. We can therefore focus on the types of transactions that are new, the types of transactions that happened during the time period. Those include additions that happened during the time period, things that uh, that were deleted or things that went away, sales that happened or, or uh, the disposals that happened for property, plant and equipment and the calculation of depreciation related to property, plant and equipment. So although then property, plant and equipment is a very significant account on the financial statements, we may be able to limit the amount of testing and can be quite complex, by the way, because of course, we're talking about, we, we could have a lot of different types of property, plant and equipment. We could have a very large schedule of property, plant and equipment that represents different types of assets that are there. We have different types of depreciation methods that may be used, and we may have different types of depreciation methods. We almost certainly will between the book value and the tax depreciation. Of course, tax depreciation schedules will differ from some degree, and we may have differences between tax depreciation of different countries and uh, different states as well. So it can be a complex system. However, the amount of transactions related to property, plant, and equipment in the current year is somewhat limited. In other words, we're not buying property and plant and equipment every day as we are with 
other types of things. It's not a daily kind of process. And therefore, we can audit a lot of the transactions, maybe all of the transactions related to things like purchases and disposals of property, plant and equipment uh, a lot more easily that where there's no way we can audit all the transactions for some other type of accounts. So if we have a new engagement, however, auditor must verify assets that make up the beginning balance in property, plant and equipment because they have not been uh, subject to audit in prior years. In other words, new engagements, if we're taking on a new client that we didn't audit last year, going to be much more complex with regards to property, plant, and equipment because we can't rely on prior year audits for the beginning balances and therefore simply test for the most part or focus most of our testing on the addition, subtractions, calculations such as depreciation as we would in a re reoccurring audit. We have to get that schedule. We have to do more testing for the beginning balance items and that of course can take more time. Transaction types. What types of transactions do we have for property, plant, and equipment? We have the acquisition of capital assets for cash or other form of compensation. So we have the purchases of property, plant, and equipment. Again, there's going to be less of them. So notice when we consider the auditing of these transactions of purchases, for smaller companies, we could probably we could audit basically all the purchases of property, plant, and equipment to some degree in terms of substantive testing. If we're talking about larger clients, uh, publicly traded businesses, then again, still the amount of, of transactions related to purchases of property, plants, and equipment are going to be less than other types of transactions. So we're going to, we can audit a higher significant uh, portion of them. And of course, the purchase of property, plants, and equipment is much more likely to be material or a relevant factor, however, because we're purchasing larger items, larger items that will be capitalized. We may be paying cash for them. We may be paying in some other way. We may be financing the property, plant, and equipment. If we are, then it's a bit more complex because we have to consider, of course, the financing option with the purchase process as well and the valuation uh, of the property, plant, and equipment with relation to that. Disposition of capital assets through sale, exchange, retirement, or abandonment. So the property, plant, and equipment may be leaving the organization. That's another type of transaction that can happen that could happen through the sale they might sell property plants and equipment remember property plants and equipment is not a normal sale within the normal type of business processes we're not selling inventory we're selling some type of equipment like a forklift or something that's going to be more of an unusual type of a transaction we could exchange it which could be a, a little bit more complex because we have that exchange process happening instead of just basically selling it for cash we could retire it meaning we basically retired it and, and in essence disposed of it, or we could abandon it, which would be a similar type of process. Notice that the retirement and abandonment items are things that we're concerned with as an auditor that may have happened and yet not have been recorded. In other words, if someone just abandoned the property, plant, and equipment or uh, are no longer using it, it may still be on the books. It may be fully depreciated, so the book value of it, asset, uh, the amount minus the accumulated depreciation might be zero but we still have the asset on the books and we may have the accumulated depreciation on the books and we should have both of them removed typically so that's one of the things that could cause some concern although from a dollar point standpoint might not be a material misstatement depreciation of capital assets over their useful uh, economic life so then we're going to have of course the depreciation process we're going to have to calculate the depreciation that's going to be one of the transactions the company does we're going to be needing to test that calculation notice that they only record depreciation periodically it's usually an adjusting entry at the end of a period such as a month so there's not going to be too many of those calculations as well those types of transactions so it should be easier for us to audit given the number of them leasing of capital assets so it's possible to have capital leases and the capital leases, of course, result in a capital asset, and they're going to be a bit more complex. So when we see that capital lease, we might want to look into that because the valuation process is going to be a bit more complex to consider. Factors to consider with regard to inherent risk for property, plant, and equipment. Remember our process here. We want to consider inherent risk, control risk, and then set detection risk related to substantive testing. Inherent risks you can think of those risk factors as if you took away the internal control how inherently risky are these items if we are the company sometimes it's useful to be able to compare uh, inherent risk factors to different areas if we had inherent risk related to cash for example 
obviously that's going to be much more inherently risky because it's more liquid people are more easily to basically uh, want to steal cash or be able to steal cash and be able to use the cash if we think about property plants and equipment it's probably more difficult to basically steal a forklift or something like that a large piece of equipment or building <laughs> and it's going to be less easy for someone to basically spend or consume the forklift personally so notice when we think the inherent risk those are the types of things we want to consider doesn't mean there's not still inherent risk with the forklifts but the inherent risk factors of course will be different we want to consider what the inherent risk factors will be with regard to property plants and equipment consider the internal internal controls then that the company has put into place and then how can we do substantive testing related to it so the complexity of the accounting issues is going to be one thing that we might want to consider with regard to inherent risk it basically depends on the type of transactions involved with property plant and equipment but because they're larger dollar amounts uh, they could be material and if we have some types of transactions related to them they can be more complex such as a uh, transaction like a capital lease uh, it could be a, a little bit more difficult for us to consider difficulty to auditing transactions so we want to consider the factor of inherent risk how easy it is it going to be for us to audit basically the transactions related to property plants and equipment do we have the documentation all the documentation that is necessary for it can and, and can we observe basically what the process is that happened possibly can we observe the actual equipment ex itself are we in at the location that we could observe it or is it some location that we can't basically observe misstatement detected in the prior years so when if there's misstatements of course in the prior year regarding inherent risk uh regarding property plant and equipment then we're going to increase the inherent risk in the current year now complexity if we have a, a straightforward type of transaction with property plants and equipment like they bought property plant and equipment and they paid cash for it well that's pretty straightforward that's not too difficult for us to consider complexity wise although the transaction would be material and therefore something we would want to consider if they bought it for a loan then they financed part of it bought a forklift paid some cash financed part of it well that's still not too unusual we could probably consider that leasing leasing if they bought it as a capital lease or if they self-constructed the capital asset they made it themselves those are two types of things that can be far more complex for us to consider the lease in the format of a lease as opposed to a purchase and then we're going to want to put it on the books as a purchase because in substance we believe it is one with regards to a capital lease can be a bit more difficult for us to think about the accounting issues related to it if they made the capital asset themselves they constructed it and then used it they made it not inventory they made the capital asset property plant and equipment to value that can be a little bit more confusing as well difficulty to audit the transactions so the easy type of transaction to audit is an is an assets purchased directly from the vendor so again if if you had a transaction where they just said hey i need a forklift they went to the vendor they bought the forklift if they bought a big piece of equipment they went to basically uh home depot and bought the equipment then it's pretty straightforward types of transaction again it might be material something we want to consider but not too difficult the more difficult types of transactions are transactions involving something like a donated property so something was donated how do we know what the value is because it's not a, on a market transaction so we want to consider that non-monetary exchanges so if there wasn't money exchanging hands then that's going to increase the complexity obviously we would consider if it was an arm length tra transaction that something was exchanged to help us to basically value on a market value method and then the self-constructed assets again that's going to be more difficult if they made the asset misstatements detected in the prior year's audit so of course when misstatements are found in the prior year the auditor will increase the inherent risk factor in the current year now we want to consider control risk so recall we think about inherent risk then the control risk to, to then set detection risk that's the amount of testing that we're going to do so control risk uh, control procedures generally part of the purchasing process when we think of controls then in other words we've thought about the purchasing process the controls should be much the same for the purchasing of property plant and equipment considering the fact that it's going to be part of the purchasing process with regard to the assertion of uh, occurrence and authorization over property plant and equipment however larger capital asset transactions may be subject to additional controls in other words uh, the company may have something in place where they're going to say this is the normal purchasing process for normal purchases if however you purchase something say over a certain dollar amount you need additional approval additional authorization for those types of purchases so we might have 
you know, more type of things that we would have to test over and above the traditional purchasing process with regard to property, plants, and equipment. Business will have an authorization table for approving capital asset transactions. Control activities will also need uh, to identify assets no longer in use. So notice that's going to be another key concern for us as the auditor. Those assets that are now obsolete or not being used that are property, plants, and equipment, they should be removed. And remember, they're not always removed. And sometimes it doesn't create a significant amount or effect on the financial statements from, from a net perspective because the, the items on the books as an asset and maybe it's fully depreciated, therefore the book value is zero. But still, the, the equipment's on the books overstated, the accumulation accumulated depreciation is on the books overstated, and therefore, uh, although the net is zero for that asset, we would still need to dispose of it. So even if the, it, and that might not be the case, it might still have valuation on the books and they're not using it, it's obsolete for some reason. So even if it's a net book of zero, we wanna have consideration to, to look at those uh, property, plant and equipment assets and remove them from the books. They shouldn't be you know, on the books. Now, when we consider the property, plant and equipment, what we're gonna do is we're gonna get a subsidiary ledger, of course. So when we think about the property, plant and equipment, we think on the balance sheet, we have the asset of the property, plant, and equipment or the list of assets that are property, plant, and equipment categorized out by land, building, equipment, and so on. And we have the accumulated depreciation, but those are all lumped together within those categories. We need then a subsidiary ledger, some type of ledger that's going to be breaking out in detail the supporting type of documentation. We have to have this information because we need to know what's actually comprising the pieces of equipment that are on the books now this can be a detailed and confusing report we need to understand that and we also need to understand that there could be uh when you consider the creation of the subsidiary ledger uh for depreciation and equipment then typically you have to do that for uh, what we're considering the book value and there should be uh, there's going to be other types of calculations that are going to be necessary at least for the taxes because the accumulated depreciation will be different typically for taxes so uh it could be a complex schedule information we're going to need on it is going to be the description of, of the property plants and equipment so we need to have a list of the property plants and equipment on there and it should notice that when you're putting together a, a property plants and equipment if you're recording property plant and equipment on the gl side of things as well just note that unlike financial accounting when, where, where we often just put something on the books as you know equipment we debit equipment <laughs> when we put it on the books in real life we want to have the description what is this this is a cat you know forklift blah blah this is maybe have a serial number on it we want to know the description of what is on there and and what we also do not want to do is put something on the books as equipment and lump together five things so if we bought like five forklifts and one you don't put the thing on there as five forklifts and debit property plant and equipment for the value of five forklifts because the subsidiary ledger isn't going to give us the detail we need the detail of all of all the actual equipment broken out because if you sell one of those forklifts and not all five of them for example that that would be a problem because now it's on the books as a lump sum one kind of thing so we need the description on there we want the location any id number so again you don't we don't put the books as a journal entry that we typically do with financial accounting just debit like equipment we need the you know it's it's in the subsidiary ledger it's a forklift and here's the id number related to that that item if we're going to sell it we're not going to use a first in first out method a flow method typically we're going to identify specifically specific identification of the item the piece of equipment that we are selling to do that we need to identify it in some way such as an identification number date of acquisition obviously we need the acquisition date that'll help us to consider the depreciation that will be considered on it depreciation methods for the books depreciation method for taxes so notice we're going to have at least two depreciation methods it could be quite confusing because different classes of assets are going to have different lives could have different depreciation methods used possibly given the different classes and there will certainly be different depreciation methods used between the book depreciation done in accordance with something like generally accepted accounting principles and the depreciation done by the tax code which is completely different so we're gonna we want to consider both of those items we are testing for the book depreciation generally accepted accounting but we also want as part of our testing to consider and possibly reconcile to uh the tax uh, in some way because that's going to be a verification process or can help us to verify considering the taxes are another form of reporting that has been done we can tie out at least 
do, do the total amount of property planted equipment and each category tie out on taxes and on our books and and uh, we can consider the reconciliation of the depreciation methods salvage value that's the value that it's going to have when at the end the estimated value at the end of the useful life that we consider at least the scrap value sometimes called and then we're going to have the estimated useful life of course and that's useful life the salvage value and the cost are things that are going to help us to consider whether or not the depreciation calculation was done correctly now we're going to consider the segregation of duties related to property plant and equipment so separation of duties segregation of duties key internal control whenever we think of internal controls one of the first things we want to think of is the separation segregation of duties obviously larger companies are going to be able to have more separation segregation of duties than smaller companies given the fact that they should have more staff to do so so first item function of initiating the purchase of a capital asset is segregated from the approval function so notice uh, part of this you're going to see some overlap of course with the purchasing process with the consideration of purchasing property plant and equipment now why would we need that because if it, if it was not segregated if those functions were not separated fictitious or unauthorized purchases of assets can occur this can result in purchases of unnecessary assets assets that may not meet the company's quality control standards or illegal payments to suppliers again as we consider these the separation of duties the segregation of duties remember that you might often think that hey you know my employees wouldn't do that i'm going to hire good people but that's not going to happen in my uh, area but just note again as, as companies grow you're going to need more separation of duties and even if you're small what you want to do is remove any risk factors the the temptation the the fact that an employee can look at something and say uh, i i could commit fraud right now and if i wanted to is actually stressful you know because you know they're involved in two areas they can actually say it's possible for that to happen people could perceive that i'm that 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 i maybe i am doing they wouldn't know because i'm involved in these two things so you want to basically remove that as much as possible as much as you're capable of doing as long as it as to the degree that it doesn't increase any problem with the functioning of the organization remove any any um any risk factors or any any temptation to commit you know fraud or anything that is there i mean you know don't set the money in the middle of the cafeteria table and and expect people to you know you're going to be taxing them on their willpower <laughs> just not to pick up the hundred dollars that's sitting in the middle of the table so you want the separation of duties as basically a benefit as well uh if it's possible to be putting those in place property plant and equipment records function is segregated from the general ledger function if this was not segregated an individual can conceal any uh defalcation that would normally be detected by reconciling subsidiary records with the general ledger control account so that reconciliation process the subsidiary ledger to the control account should be a, a good control to have if we have the same person involved they could adjust those accounts then of course the, that control would be less effective the property and plant and equipment pp and e records function is segregated from the custodial function so the pp and e records and then the custodial the people that are basically taking care of or overseeing uh the the actual uh maintenance or the caretaking of the property plant and equipment you could you consider them having basically possession in some sense of the property plant and equipment if this was not segregated tools and equipment can be stolen and the theft can be concealed by adjusting the accounting records and then we have when a periodic physical inventory of pp and e is done and this should happen periodically notice the property plant and equipment uh, is going to be physical type of inventory or physical type of things similar to inventory in that it has a physical presence inventory is something we count for sure the property plant and equipment because it's larger and whatnot may not have the physical count as often but we should still have basically that physical count just to verify the presence of the property plant and equipment so when a periodic physical inventory of property plant and equipment is done the individual responsible for the for the inventory needs to be independent of the custodial and record keeping function and again remember when we're thinking inventory here we're thinking inventory of property plant and equipment not inventory the things that we're selling type of inventory if this is not segregated theft of the ent entity's capital assets can then be concealed now we'll consider the substantive analytical procedures related to pp and e property plant and equipment 
These are the substantive tests. So we've, we've talked about inherent uh, risk, control risk, and now we're thinking about these substantive tests related to the detection risk. So these are substantive testing, but they're analytical substantive testings. Remember, these are things like comparing ratios. These are things when I would think of myself as basically or the cozy auditor that's in my own office in the audit firm comparing just numbers and ratios and whatnot. It's instead of the substantive test that we would typically think of as substantive tests going out, for example, and seeing that the that these uh, property plants and equipment are there, pulling invoices, being at the business's office. So these are analytical procedures. We could prepare prior year balances and current year balances in property plants and equipment and depreciation. So that's our standard kind of thing. What, what happened last year? What happened this year? What's the difference between the two? What's the dollar change? What's the percentage change that could give us some idea of if the change is significant and what's going on with them? Then we can compute the ratio of depreciation expense to the related PP&E property plant and equipment account. So depreciation expense to PP&E and compare to the prior year's ratios as well. So we can do that ratio analysis and compare our results to prior year. Compute the ratio of repairs and maintenance expense to the related PP&E accounts. Remember that repairs and maintenance is something that we want to we want to consider because we also want to consider things like uh, is something recorded to repairs and maintenance that should have been capitalized. So this kind of ratio of, re of repairs and maintenance, for example, what if they completely overhaul the entire piece of equipment, then you would think, well, maybe it shouldn't be repairs and maintenance as an expense. Maybe it should be something that uh, should be capitalize as as part of an improvement to the actual asset so that's something that we want to be considerate of that's this ratio will give us some idea possibly of that as well we can compare that to prior years compute the ratio of insurance expense to related pp and e accounts so insurance related to the pp and e and we can compare that to prior years and we can review the capital budget so they should have a budget if you're talking about publicly traded companies they should have a capital budget meaning how much they plan on spending for things like capital assets. And we can take that capital budget and compare amounts spent with amounts budgeted to spend.